Wednesday, everyone. We'll start class. We can do one minute of questions, two questions. I'll take two questions. Zero questions. All right, good. Just to try Is there a slight hand? Somebody has to raise their hand and ask a question. We don't have to. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so we've been looking at folks. I can hear all of you talking. The acoustics here are really good. Okay, so we've been talking about this week, we've been talking about attacks on local applications and attacks on Linux binaries. And some of these attacks will generalize to any type of application, but here we're really focused on local attacks. The next attack that we're going to talk about is what we call talk to attacks, which stands for time of check to time of use attacks. So these are actually one of my favorite types of attacks. The idea is the program is making a check and saying, let's say, what are the permissions on this file? And then later on in that program's code, it then does something to that file. So let's say that it first checks, hey, is this file owned by root, let's say. And then if it is, it'll open the file up for editing, right? So if it's using strings to specify these files, right? And it says check, uh, check the file permissions on this file with this uh, name, this file path. And then later it checks, hey, open up this file name with file path. What happens there? So let's, I think it'll be easier with the deck. And this is a very generalizable problem. And the idea essentially is just what we've been looking at. So there's the time that you're checking the security properties of something, and you have some assumption A. Then in T2, you're using that entity, and you're assuming that your check was still valid. So in this case, you're opening up the file based on the file name, and you are assuming that the property is still valid there. And there is a time of attack that we can create that is in between T1 and T2 to invalidate that assumption. And there's a lot of different ways you can think about these things. Uh, oh, this is a little. Can you still see this? I don't know why. It sometimes weirdly does this with the quick time recording. I'm not sure what's happening. <coughs> So there's many different ways that this can manifest itself as vulnerability. There could be data race conditions when you have multiple um, processes who all have access to some shared data. So if you don't have any kind of locking mechanism or anything in place there to where only one processor can check the data and then use it, then you could come up, with, uh, you could run into this top two vulnerability. And so, the way this actually happens in Linux applications is there is, so similar to we had that is root check, there's this access system call that attempts to estimate, hey, would the real user of this program be able to access this file? Right? Where real user is the user who started the program, not the affected user ID, which is the set UID user. And as we saw, the open call takes in a string, so both of them take in string. So it's something like this. If access file name WOKZ was zero, then open the file name as write only, and then write to that file descriptor. <coughs> so what's the key problem? How do you fix this? What was that? Who's not able to open it? 
Open uses our effective user ID, so it's using the set UID permission. Right? Because the program is executing as root, so it says, yeah, root can open this file. Validate again after opening? Um, yeah, how, though? Using file descriptor. Yes, using file descriptor. So this is the key here, right, is we have these strings which point to a file, but they don't specify an exact file. So when open returns, we know that that file descriptor we have will be the same file the entire lifetime that that file is open. Right, so we can write to that file and we know nobody's going to switch out that file and make us try to write to a different file. This file exists and the operating system itself holds on to that file for us. It says, okay, here, I'm keeping this file open for you, which you specified with the path on the string for the file name. And I will make sure that any time you write to that using this file descriptor, it will go to this file. Any time you read from it, it will go to this file descriptor. So the key problem here is that this access and the open command take in file names, right? And the core problem is that anything can happen to the file system in between those two steps. So it's not always the case that the same file will be checked in both cases. Questions? Cool. So, the way to keep yourself safe is to use versions of system calls that only use file descriptors instead of file path names. So that would be one thing we just talked about, right? Uh, try to perform file descriptor bindings first. So, like we said, uh, you may also be able to use some functionality to lock the file. So you can lock the file first, then do your checks, and then open the file. And through that whole time, you know that no other process can access that file. Uh, there's also this, can be this problem with uh, the old make temp system call, which we talked about. There's a new secure version. Uh, because that would actually create the file first and then give you the file name, and then would, you would have to open that file to read and write to that temporary file. So in the meantime, somebody could change the location of that temporary file and get your program to execute, or to write to anywhere else. Okay. Questions on top of Yeah. Uh, so you said uh, there could be a time lapse between the checking and the using, right? Yes. And so what if uh, you just uh, use the semaphore, let's say, to lock onto the file? Yes, in that case, as long as, so, the key is there's, a, there's always going to be a difference between the time of checking and the time of using, right? What if you put a sleep in the middle and you just lock onto the file for a long time? So, yeah, so the big, basic idea is you not only, there's always going to be a time in between those two operations, right? <coughs> Unless the operating system guarantees you that these will execute at the same time, right? So there's always going to be a time delta the question is, can anybody tamper with the file system or anything else in that time period? So in this case, if you lock the file and the operating system guarantees that nobody else can access that file, then absolutely, it doesn't matter how long your delta is, nobody else can do anything to that file in between those points of time. Same thing with opening a file. When you open a file and you get a file descriptor, that file is held open for your process the whole time. Nobody else can touch that file. So could this time, like, be limited to a certain window, so that if you're inactive for a Maybe time off. Uh, I mean, it would depend on what semaphores and locking mechanisms you're using, but if you want to be secure, you wouldn't want that, right? Because then somebody would just have to find a way to get you to sleep long enough to where you lose that privilege, right? So you need a guarantee for that entire time delta, nobody else can touch that file. Or, if we're talking files, but this applies to anywhere. Another really, yes? Uh, can you make a check, uh, uh, like after checking uh, the file is available or not, you make a uh, check that uh, for a particular time, it's not open, then you should uh, check it again? Uh, yeah, in that case, though, why do the first check? You should just do the second check, right? Because 
And now you're already saying the first check is useless. So in that case, uh, we are saving uh, that time if a tagger has created multiple processes and we are saving that time. Yeah, but I'd rather be secure than efficient. I mean, you're still performing double checks every time, right? So in the case that you're not being attacked, you're always doing double checks, right? I would say the better way is to just err on the side of safety if it's safety versus slight performance benefit. Um, I would always err on the side of safety. Okay, so this gets back into a little bit about how applications read and write to files. So what are the three main file descriptors on Unix applications? What's the first one? What is the first one? What, is it, what are we starting with? What are we starting to count with? Zero, because we're computer scientists. What's file descriptor zero? Standard input. What's file descriptor one? Standard output. And file descriptor two? Standard error. Yes, I'm going to drill that into your head. So then what happens when you open up a file? What file descriptor does it return when you call open on a file? A number greater than two, usually three is the first one, and the next one will be four, and the one after that will be five. Right? So these are just, and there's no guarantee that the operating system has to do it this way. Right? That's why you get essentially this opaque integer that doesn't mean anything to the application, but it's how the operating system maps this number to an open file descriptor. Right? So by default, you always have three file descriptors open, and so the rest of them after that will start usually three, four, five, six. And so, lots of set UID applications need to open files to perform some tasks, right? This is exactly what the uh, chain shell program does, right? It opens etc password, and it actually will write to etc password in order to write and change that file. So, and oftentimes, right, in the effort of not repeating functionality, you may need to fork out and call to external, an external process, right? You may want to grep something, you may want to, I don't know, do whatever you want to do, uh, just like some people did with the, uh, the Macromer web server getting gzip to work because they called out to gzip, right? To actually do that functionality. Well, the same thing with the Macromer web server when I got a command, right? You had to run, uh, fork a process essentially and run that command. Now, the question is, what happens, so what does happen, so we talked about what is forking a process, what does that do? <coughs> yeah, fork creates an identical process, right? So it creates an identical process, what's the only difference between the two? The process ID is different, but that's not necessarily in the process itself. Different what? Keep sections? No. The return value of fork, that is the only difference between the two process, right? The child and the parent. I believe the, I don't remember the exact semantics, I think it's something like the parent gets returned the process ID of the child and the child gets returned zero, I think, or something like that. Um, so those are the only difference between the two. And then, so what does that mean when we fork? What does that mean about file descriptors then? It's the same for both. Same for both. Right? Whatever was standard input for the parent is now standard input for the child. Same with uh, standard output, standard error, and any open files. And then when we want to call out to another program, we have to call exec. Right, which is then going to replace our current process with a new process that it loads from disk. Right, and that's how we said new, a brand new, different process gets executed. We call fork and then exec. And on exec, what happens then with those file descriptors?
yeah, the new process also has access to all the new file descriptors. So uh, when you think about it, well, I won't get into that too much. Um, so yeah, so the new process inherits the standard input, the standard output, the standard error of the parent of the original process, and all of the open file descriptors as well. So let's say you have a program that reads, a set UID program that reads, let's say the EPG shadow file. So it opens it, which means it has a file descriptor. And then it calls exec to call out to some other program. What does that program now have access to? Yeah, the file descriptor. So it can read from file descriptor three or four, whatever it is to read that open file. And so that's exactly the problem with file handle, handler reuse. So the idea is these file handles are reused and passed between children and fork processes, and the fork process. And so by using this, we can try to maybe read any files that were open in the set UID process. Uh, so there is, of course, a way to do this securely. Also, of course, it is not the default. This is another instance where insecure API default means that people develop it insecure first because they don't know about how to do it securely. So if this close on exec flag is not set, the file descriptor will remain open. Um, and of course, these may provide access, right? So in case any of these open files are important, um, the Children process can read or write to those programs. Yes? This flag is set on open? Is that the idea? Um, I believe so. It's either open or exec. I would think you should be able to specify it per file descriptor, but I'm not 100% sure on that. If somebody wants to look that up, that would be good. Raise your hand. So this is not an abstract vulnerability. The, there have been uh, instances of this. So the CH pass command is you know, just like the PASSWD command on Linux, right? It allows you to change your password. And so to do this, it would create a temporary copy of the, so on BSD, so we're talking about BSD, so they have a different system, right? They don't necessarily have ENC password, all that stuff. Um, and so the change password created a temporary copy of the database, and it spawned an editor. So it opened up an editor so that you could change and edit your password. Uh, then when it committed it, it took that, copied it, so this makes sense actually from a software engineering perspective, right? Because if you're writing, let's say, a change password function, would you want to write an entire editor too? No. And would you want to force your specific editor on the user? No, because you'll get people like me who hate using Vim, you'll force them into Vim, or if you decide to do Emacs, you'll force the Vim people into Emacs, or Nano people into Nano, right? Or it's all kinds of madness, right? So why not just let the user decide which ones they want to do? And with certain editors, with actually almost all editors now, so with VI, there's a way to, there's an escape to shell function, which allows you to run shell commands from inside the editor. And so we could you could get a shell, and that shell would have the open file descriptor of this temporary password database, which then you could read and write from to, in order to edit and change your file permissions. Uh, it's actually a pretty cool vulnerability. Uh, so it's like a multi-step. So the idea is the original CH pass is the one that has this open file descriptor. It invokes VI, which from there we can go to a shell, and that shell still has the open file descriptor of the original change pass. And so by editing that file descriptor, we can then, all the changes we made will get merged back into the old database, so we can make ourselves root. Um, we can do any kind of fun stuff that you want to do. 
because the change password function um, program has to be root, right? It's running a set UID root. So, what some things to do is, if you want to be secure and you want to prevent this, you want to make sure that there are no open file descriptors that are inherited by fork programs. So this is a pretty simple-ish fix, but it's something that can be easily overlooked because, like I said, it's not the default. Questions on this? type of vulnerability that we're going to talk about is command injection and this occurs in multiple like pretty much all over the place so you'll find these in web applications um, binaries lots of places so the idea like we said was that hey rather than for some of you rather than writing your own gzip library Right? Why not call out to the gzip program on Linux? Right? And this is, occurs a lot in all types of software, right? It's, hey, we don't want to deal with this. Let's reuse somebody else's functionality right? and use this tool or command. So, how do you call an arbitrary command on Linux? Or how can you? System. System! Yes, you all look at that on the back of our web server, right? Almost like that is actually relevant to this class. So, how does system actually work? What does it do? You can talk about high level. So it does fork exec on whatever you give, but how does it know no, what files to open? Is it just a fork and then an exec? Open and and I don't think the system itself actually stores standard out at all, unfortunately, which a lot of you have to use different function calls for that. But on some languages it does, like on Python system returns you just the standard app. I think also PHP, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Would it see if the command in the string is in the environmental path? Yeah, so it has to look that up in the environment path. Um, is it just used for executing commands? So can you just do slash bin slash s ls? You can run executables. Can you pass arguments to the executables? Yes. Yeah? What can you do with the output of those executables? Redirect them to a file? Is that normal program functionality? Is that just forking and exec executing a program? Can you pipe input between programs? So it's the equivalent as if you're where? On the, on the command line, exactly. So it's just as if you're in front of a terminal and you're typing your command, whatever string you pass in the system, that's what the operating system is going to do. So there's actually a lot more steps in between the fork and exec, right? Because we're actually having to parse this string to determine, okay, what commands to execute? Are there any and, and there's so many things that, that Bash does, right? It's looking, are there any file redirections? Are there any pipes? Are there any background processes working? Are there any ampersands or ors in order to execute conditionally commands? Right? Are there any semicolons for multiple commands at once? Right? This is all shell functionality. So actually what it does is this the exact same thing as passing your string slash bin slash sh dash c with your string? So dash c 
tells sh that you're trying to execute a command. And so bin sh does all that stuff. It's parsing this string as if you had typed it on the command line. The same thing with popen. So some of you use popen, right? Popen does the same thing, forks and execs it as a shell. So, what's the language look like for this input string here? What characters are important? Uh, dash isn't really important to the parsing, it's important to the program itself. Right? The program gets to decide how it wants to read arguments. Space. Spaces are important. What do spaces do? What was that? <coughs> yeah, so tokenizes the input, right? So specifies the difference between what's a, the executable we're trying to execute and what are the arguments to that executable. What else? What else is important? Which slash? The escaping slash? Or are you talking about? Oh, backslash now, the escaping slash. What else? The number of arguments. The number of arguments, uh, not really part of the string. It has to parse and figure out how many arguments based on the spacing. Right? What else? What was that? Quotes. Quotes. Double quotes or single quotes, right? You can have, this is how you can pass arguments to a program that have spaces. Right? You include double quotes and you can have any kind of spaces you want. Inside that string, if, inside the double quotes, if you want to pass in double quotes, you have to escape it. So you also have double and single quotes. Dot. Dot. What was that? Dot. 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 What does the dot do? If there's an extension in the file as an argument. Uh, on Linux, actually, dot does nothing. So the dot's not important <coughs> at all. Yeah. Do you have your hand up? Do you want to answer anyways? <laughs> yeah. Like an and. And the ampersand symbol. So the ampersand symbol has two different uses. One is to run a program in the background. Another one, so a single ampersand means run the preceding command in the background. Thus two ampersands next to each other means uh, conditionally execute the next command if the previous command returned true, which the return value has to be zero. What else? What was that? Semicolon. Semicolon separates commands. Semicolon says, now everything else is now not uh, an argument. This is a new command that I want you to execute after your the previous command. What else? Pipe. Pipe also has two different uses. What is a single pipe? Yeah, so take the output of the program on the left and make it be what? The in yeah, so we can actually talk about this incredibly precisely, which is how you should be thinking. The pipe means set the standard <coughs> output of the program on the left, make that be the standard input of the program on the right. And the operating system creates a buffer between the two where the other one can write to it and it'll write up to a fixed amount and then it'll basically wait and sleep the other one and try to write more, and it waits until the other process reads from that buffer, and then as it reads from that buffer, that creates new space for it to read more. Right, so this is all, and it's literally just about creating the file descriptor. So essentially the, it's actually not the OS, it's bash creates this buffer in between the two, and it just manages the communication, and it sets that up as a file descriptor. <coughs> So we have bar for piping output, and we have double bar for or, right? So execute this command, and if that was false, then execute the command on the right. Yeah. Arrow. Arrow, what is, which, what's an arrow? Angle brackets. Angle brackets, yes. I think the arrow has to have the dash first when I think of it. Um, preferably two dashes, otherwise that's a weird, uh, not really an arrow. Uh, so, 
the arrow brackets for redirection. And they actually do a lot more things, right? So there's, let's see if we do this. There's a single arrow is to redirect the standard output to this file. So what does bash do when it sees that? It says, good, create this file. I have a file descriptor. And make the standard output of that program this file descriptor. And go. And that's all that happens. Same as reading in. If you re redirect in input, it's open this file, open this file, and set the file descriptor of standard input to be that file. And so that's when the programs only ever have to read from standard input and standard output, but you still get this beautiful redirection and typing functionality because Bash is changing what standard input means to that program, but they just think they're reading from standard input. Okay, so we got redirections. This is why you also can do, uh, let's see, I think of how to do this off the top of my head, I can't remember. I think it's the two and the, and the angle bracket. That's to redirect. Yeah, stand, so that's to redirect file descriptor two. So I think you have to do one. So you have to have two and then the bracket and then one, which is redirect standard error to standard output. And so that's how you can capture both in one stream. All kinds of complicated stuff. What else? There's still other functionality that we haven't touched on. What is that? Percent? Question mark. What's question mark do? I'm asking you because I don't know. <laughs> I shouldn't say that out loud. I just think I know everything. Uh, you're trying to match what though? Like in the shell, is that grep functionality or is that? I don't know either. Yeah. Right, but I think that's, is that an argument to grep? You pass yeah. Yeah. that to grep, but that's a grep specific functionality. I don't know whether it's shell functionality. It might be because you still have wildcard. So since nobody's talking about that, right? The asterisk, right, is wildcard functionality. So that's actually shell functionality to look for all of current files in the file directory and replace them there with that argument. What else? Dollar sign. Dollar sign. Incredibly important. What all are all the things you can do with dollar sign? What's dollar sign home? Yeah, home, so environment variables. So the dollar sign is a way for you to access environment variables. So like dollar sign home, H-O-M-E, means at this point in the program, it, at this point in, before you execute this program, replace this with the current value of home in the environment. Is that the only reason dollar sign is used? Yeah. Uh, you actually, you don't have to show scripts. Yeah, you, I can't remember. I, I usually don't use that to set it, and I don't know if that's a bad thing. I don't know if that's a standard thing or not. So is it only for variables? Does it have other uses? Yeah. Like, write a command to a command line. Hello, for something. And then execute that particular command post, and then. Ooh, okay, so loop. To one line. Like, are you talking about, like, wow? Do you use the dollar sign on that? Increment. Actually, don't know. As in, like, for i in dollar and then a command. Ah, yes, okay, I see. So you can define a variable uh, that way in the looping. Okay, what? Well, actually, we can go in another direction. Yeah. Uh, dollar sign parentheses, where it executes the command inside the parentheses and takes that output and just puts it in there. Yeah, so let's look at this. Let's see how this syntax for that. Cool. So uh, we walked through a simple example, even though we basically already did. Um, yeah, so here we're building up the cat slash var slash log rv1 command here. So one thing, if this is a set UID binary, set UID binary, what's one thing that this is vulnerable to? Yeah. Well, maybe. 
We're going to talk about AI. Dot, dot, attack. And dot, dot, attack. We can cat out any file. Right, from here. We can read any file. So it's already vulnerable to a dot, dot, attack. But, specifically, we can then use it to output any file we want, right? So we can do it just like we've been talking about. We can do a semicolon to output things, anything that we want. So this is not a, an arbitrary thing. So command injection vulnerabilities are incredibly serious because you essentially get full access to the system as if you were this user, right? And they've been around a long time, they still remain today. So these, like I said, are in several other contexts. One of those is the shell shock vulnerability. So does anyone remember hearing about this? Too long ago, too mad or too long people. Um, so in 2014, there was actually a huge bug found in Bash that had been there, I believe, for I want to say 20, 25 years. Um, and what happened was, and this is kind of a combination of things, but the idea is similar to what we've been talking about, Bash instances inherit the environment from whoever forked them and exact them. Right, so a batch instance inherits all the environment variables. And there is this definitely unknown functionality of bash that if you wanted to pass, let's say, a function from one instance of bash to a child instance, you would create a special environment variable that looked this certain way, and then bash would execute that, that function in order to get that function definition. So Bash, as literally every time it would start up, would look through all the environment variables, see if any were defined in this way, would take that code and basically execute it. So it looked like this. So if anybody, um, if you set an environment variable whose value started with parentheses, followed by function definition, it would be executed by the interpreter in order to create this, this function. So on the surface, this doesn't seem to be a problem, right? You can't, so this would only be, you can change your environment, right? You can inject environment variables, but every instance of Bash you execute will be executing as you, the user, right? Bash is not a set UID program because that would be horrible, right? So it seems on the face of it that, yeah, this is just like a simple little problem. So this actually has two problems. So one is you can pass when you SSH. So actually, you've seen this. So when you, um, as part of the WeChal challenges, or so, sorry, as part of the Bandit challenges, the integration with WeChal, I should probably just sign out the pronunciation. You can specify in your SSH configs what environment variables to pass to your remote shell. So it is possible, if you've ever wondered, how can I get, um, how can I clone a repository from GitHub using SSH or my SSH key without getting an account on GitHub's servers? So the way they do this is there's actually a way in your authorized key file, you can specify that certain users can only run certain commands. So you can create incredibly limited shells. So this would be, for one instance, if you wanted one machine to be able to access another machine without a password, and have full access to the system to do backups, uh, you can have it to where anytime that program SSHs to that system, it only runs the backup command and nothing else. But with this functionality, now if I can pass arbitrary shell parameters, uh, sorry, pass arbitrary environment variables to a remote server, I can then get it to execute any commands that I want, which essentially uh, destroys that functionality. So it completely hosed these like limited access SSH accounts. So you could do things like this um, to get the ETC shadow password. And a really critical problem here was web applications, and specifically CGI web applications. So we haven't talked about web applications yet, but at a high level, CGI is a technology that allows you to write 
a web application in any language. All you do is create an executable file. So you can have a CGI web application that's C code. But as part of this, there's a defined protocol for how parameters are passed from the user's web request to your CGI program, and they happen to use environment variables. So every certain parameters are set as environment variables, and so remotely, just by making one single web, re web request, you could get arbitrary code to execute as the user of that system, uh, or as the, the user of that web application. So you can execute arbitrary code through a web request using this vulnerability. So that's why this was such a huge issue and there was a really big push to roll out patches and fix servers, it was like a huge deal. <coughs> because this was such a widespread problem in so many different scenarios. So, how do you fix this? How? Sanitize the input. What was that? To only accept certain commands. Only accept certain commands? So if you're expecting a command, yes, you can do that. What if you're expecting file names? Yeah, so we talked about that, right? Whitelist versus blacklist, right? So I'd say this is a really good instance of demonstrating that blacklists are very hard. Because there's not just a single character you can eliminate to fix these, right? It really depends. There's a whole host of characters. So one way to do this would be to, you know, would be to specify that the user input before you ever add it is either alphanumeric, and that's it, and don't allow anything else, right? Another way to do it, so there are sanitization functions you can use. Um, so it depends on the specifics here. But fundamentally, yes, there is. Uh, there are functions you can call to properly escape, but usually you have to be even careful with those because you have to be careful to place them inside double quotes usually. So even doing the sanitization, it can look like it's done correctly, but can actually be incorrect and cause problems. So it depends on the assumptions of the sanitization routine. The other way is to never use these functions. Never use system and be open. If you use the function exec or exec VE, so these you pass in argv vectors to, to the operating system. So there, there's absolutely no parsing involved, and that's the key there. Right? The key is the problem is the bin sh is parsing. The shell is parsing these strings that are passed in. So you basically throw that out, but then you don't get any cool stuff like redirection or piping or anything like that in your commands. So you have to be very careful with this. And it show up in a lot of times. Any questions on this before we continue? Yes? Does the exec be only execute one single command? Yes. Yes, only one command, right? So that's, you're essentially giving up flexibility by making it much more rigid, but you get added security because you know only this program will execute. And even if I pass the second argument, the, ar the user can arbitrarily put whatever they want, but that RB1 is passed directly to the, to the program that I execute. There's no parsing involved. 